me for God's word to us today. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpha, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malin and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you might find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old even to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight, and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned <laughs> against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even, even, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to Ruth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. According to the latest data, 2017, from the United Nations and cited by Pew Research on the number of people living outside their birth country, there are more than 250 million migrants worldwide. Nearly 6 in 10 Syrians have been displaced in the ongoing conflict there, while at least a million from Sub-Saharan Africa have moved to Europe since 2010. In the United States, as the baby boomers age, it is predicted by the Census Bureau in a report from March of this year that beginning in 2030, net International net international migration is expected to overtake natural increase as the driver of population growth in the United States, 
That is, we will grow in population more by those who migrate here than by births of babies. In coming decades and continuing the trend, the racial composition of the population is ex expected to diversify further so that by 2060, one in three Americans is projected to be a race other than white. The fastest growing racial ethnic group in the United States today is people who identify as two or more races, which is projected to grow 200% by 2060. Our country is changing. Our world is changing. We, the people, are changing. Admittedly, statistical reports aren't the most evocative sermon meat. In fact, they might just be the worst. <laughs> Yet they confirm what it is that we already know, what we see outside of this place, what we live every day. And as we here in this place this morning read of migrants in our scripture story, it is interesting to think of. It is a good reminder to know that people have and will always be on the move. Populations continue to change, and people continue to wrestle with just how to navigate that change. Post-exile Israel, that is, Israel after the violent removal of leaders and scholars and regular folk, and the forced rule by Assyrians to the north and Babylonians to the south, Post-exile Israel was faced with such change. And we may well know that there was not just one voice on how the people of God responded to such change. There were some who argued deftly for walls for the sake of security and purity for the sake of people who felt threatened on all sides. Fear is a great motivator, and this small band of Israelites was known for their fidelity to this one God, Yahweh. And we should not discount this, for the threat around them was real. There were bigger and badder armies from the lands around them and people who did not seem to know this Yahweh God. They were responding to what they knew, had known and experienced. The taking of foreign wives for the sons of Judah was particularly then reviled for this reason, for they might draw other wives, faithful men, towards the sin of worshiping other gods. The clearest witness to which we see in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, where the congregation of exiles was told to confess their wrongdoing to the God of Israel and to send their foreign wives and children away. The penalty for not doing so was further exile from their people, further trauma, and an even more fragile state of being. Among those wives who were especially egregious to take were the Moabite women. For in Deuteronomy, it is remembered that the Moabites and the Ammonites did not meet the escaped slaves from Egypt with bread and water, so the people were commanded to harden their hearts. You shall never promote their welfare or their prosperity as long as you live. Disdain for the other is a strong motivator. Yet there is another voice. This one draws from the well, neither of fear or retribution, but rather the joy of those just newly arrived in the promised land, those who had been foreigners themselves. The command was for mercy as they settled into this new place. You must never oppress the foreigner, for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. This other voice, this is the voice of Esther, of Jonah, of Isaiah, and of Ruth. Ruth, the Moabite, for foreigner, despised by Judean's wife, and Naomi, the one who was ironically named Contentment. 
Naomi, she who with her husband fled their home because in the house of bread, that is Bethlehem, where they lived, there was in fact no bread. They were on the brink of starvation, and so they went. She who, while in Moab, buried not only her husband, but also her two sons, all that she had, all that gave her place and security and name and contentment, she who then had no other choice but to go home from Moab to Judah, resigned to her bitter fate. Ruth and Orpah at first would not let her go alone. They were loyal and steadfastly loving to this woman with whom they'd endured tremendous loss. It's those who show up in our loss whom we cling to, those who do not let us go alone into the depths of grief while so many others fall away unsure of what to do or say. Orpah eventually accepted the pathway home, kissing her mother-in-law through her tears. And with sheer determination, Ruth stayed, clung to Naomi, and with impassioned words often used in the covenant of marriage, created a new family right before their eyes, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, Judean and Moabite. These two women were a new family. Accepting this, mind you, was risky for Naomi as much as it was for Ruth. Naomi knew what her people thought of Moabites. There was a very good chance that as a widow, she might have been welcomed, helped, cared for, as was the command to the Israelites to watch after the widow and the orphan and the poor. But as a widow who had accepted a foreign woman for her sons, it might very well be the case, given the climate, that she would be cast out. All of a sudden, neither of them belonged anywhere or to anyone anymore. So instead, they chose to belong to one another and to God. They always belonged to God. For while God is not an explicit character in this particular story, we know full well that God is always acting. Rather than a witness to all the reasons why it's safer to keep to our own, the beginning of Ruth and Naomi's story, and indeed the whole story, as we will hear more next week, offers a realignment of who our own might just be. In fact, the practice of walls and foreign wives and the small number of elect is challenged here by a Moabite woman of all people who will take Naomi's Yahweh as her own, who will sacrifice her future to give her Judean mother-in-law even a slim chance for one. Every single border they thought they had in place is transgressed by the deep and committed relationship of these two. So what are we to know then? In light of Ruth and Naomi, or in light of Ezra and Nehemiah, two very different ways of understanding how to be in the midst of change. What are we to take into what we know and see around us? What we feel in this election week? And much more than this week into the reality of our changing country and changing world and changing people, our fearful country and fearful world and fearful people. There is another story in the Gospel of Mark that comes to mind just a bit before the one that Max read this morning. It's in the time when the disciples will st were still trying to define their own. Not long ago, Jesus had been transfigured before some of them, and things were getting serious. He was talking about his death and his resurrection, all the while continuing to heal and exercise demons and transgress the borders of law and compassion. Meanwhile, the disciples were fighting amongst themselves, fearful, I am sure, and trying to stick it out, much less stick it together. 
One day they came upon a man who was exercising demons in the name of Jesus, and they told their leader about this. The disciples said, look, we saw this man casting out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not following us. He was not one of us. Do you know what Jesus told them in return? Well, he didn't say, good job. <laughs> he didn't say, was he exercising in my way? He didn't say, did you ask for identification? <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples, let him be. It is not for you to say who is us and who is not us. Any who would act with compassion, says Jesus, is us. Then just a little way down the line when being questioned every which way to Sunday about the proper interpretation of the law, Jesus made this us crystal clear. The greatest of the commands, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And when the scribe agreed with him that these were more important even than every other act commanded by tradition, Jesus named his wisdom and said that he was near to the kingdom of God. To love God and to love your neighbor as yourself convicts us. And this is central to everything else that we do. This is welcome, this is worship, this is service, this is stewardship, this is compassion, this is near to the kingdom of God. This is what Ruth did and what Naomi did in return. As much as we might want to and as the disciples did, as Christ followers, we don't need to define who our neighbor is, what she looks like, where she comes from, how he worships, what language he speaks, how she got here, what lever he pulls or button she presses. And as terrifying as it has become, to live in a world in which it feels like we'd all be safer if we could just lock the gate and shutter the windows. We cannot live with each other, defined by that fear. That is not life that is worth living anymore. That is not life. And Jesus came so that we might have life and have it in abundance. Jesus came transgressing the borders of Galilee and Nazareth and Judea and Bethlehem, of law and compassion, of life and death, so that we might understand our neighbor differently. Our country is changing. Our world is changing. We, the people, are changing. This is not new. But as scripture tells us, it has always been the way of things. So what will we do? While well, Ruth clung to Naomi, and Naomi held on tight all the way back to Judah, it is Ruth who shows up later in the lineage of Jesus, as outlined by the Gospel of Matthew. She is the great-grandmama of King David, this Moabite wife, this foreigner, this one who was despised, who should have never been there in the first place. And Jesus tells his disciples, it is not for you to say who is one of us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself.